Hello everyone, so as I'm sure many of you are aware of at this point, Sony has delayed their upcoming PlayStation 5 reveal event of games that was planned for June 4th due to the current climate and situation that's happening across America right now, which I think was the right move. Sony uh, issued a statement claiming it's difficult to celebrate games when there's just so many other voices that need to be heard right now. I think Sony read the room here correctly, very reasonable, totally expected. A lot of other companies actually following suit for events that were planned this week. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that I even really have to mention this, but number one, please be respectful to one another in the comments. And number two, for whatever ridiculous reason that you may disagree with this, just keep in mind, we will get our PlayStation 5 news eventually. We're going to get the games, we're going to get the console, it's still launching holiday 2020, both Sony and Microsoft keep reassuring that they're on track for release. There's nothing untoward going on here, but... At least for this video, you know, we had the Friday predictions video for this upcoming event, and I didn't even really get to cover everything in that video, right? It was already up to 20 minutes long. I don't like going any longer than that unless it's a documentary or something. So let's cover up some recent statements from Jim Ryan, some of these rumors that we've been hearing. Uh, that way, if Let's Talk PlayStation this coming week also isn't ridiculously long. So let's consider this video uh, a Let's Talk PlayStation bonus round. <laughs> So let's kick it off in typical LTPS fashion. I'm over here on the side. Let's bring in a new story and we will start with the fact that Sony was actually airing the teaser for the event on live television. Now, poor timing here, of course. Uh, ads aren't bought, sold, and run all in a single day, so this was prepared ahead of time. The decision to postpone was obviously last minute, but the fact that they were putting marketing dollars into this really means they are starting their marketing campaign and uh, this very much was probably a meaningful event like we were led to believe from the past two, three weeks of rumors where we've been hearing that Sony wants this all to be PlayStation 5 gameplay. They want to avoid third parties not having optimized PS5 uh, footage to show. We already know that it's about an hour long and at minimum it's going to be a game showcase. So of course, a lot of people wondering if the console design will be there. Not very likely, but at minimum we know it's an hour of games, which is a significant amount of time, especially when we look at something like the PS4 reveal in 2013, where that was like two hours long, but that was really an all-in-one show. Not only was it uh, one of those in-person, on-stage events, but uh, it was Tech Talk, the controller, a small glimpse of the UI, a lot of, you know, drawn-out conversations, a technical demo, and then game announcements. Whereas a lot of this stuff has already been piecemealed out, right? I mean, we've got our tech talk from the road to PS5. We've got uh, what the controller looks like, the dual sense. We had a technical demonstration from Unreal Engine 5. So this really should be just a straight showcase of games, 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 trailer, trailer, trailer. That should be the expectation here. With the console design, I've already said it how many times now, but people still getting fired up about this. If it's not here, we don't have to wait long. Manufacturing has to start soon. So don't get hung up on the fact that it may not be at this event you'll have to wait what another few weeks a month at the worst to see what the console looks like and then again the ui probably will be much later down the road probably like august i'd imagine now one conversation that keeps cropping up is from the game industry.biz interview with si president and ceo jim ryan where he stated pretty much flat out that playstation 5 would have exclusive games that ps4 will not and uh this is considered a new story apparently a lot of people talking about this if it's right doesn't make sense which is just baffling to me, as if this wasn't the general expectation of a brand new hardware launch, not just from Sony, but any manufacturer, where we have decades of console generations to look at here. I mean, there's maybe only a handful of examples where a first party uh, piece of software was available on the outgoing system and the next one. But for the most part, this is the expectation, right? And I, I understand that a big part of why people are talking about this is because Microsoft's been very forward about their strategy, which is they will support Xbox One for about two years into the Series X lifecycle before they abandon that platform completely. They want to release on X1, Series X, and PC, as if this wasn't already in their playbook for years anyway. So we kind of saw that approach from Microsoft, but they've been forward about how they're not going to really do exclusive games on Series X unless it's a third party that makes their own decision willingly, right? Um, now that's fine for them. It's certainly a different strategy, but it's just that different. It's an outlier. It's not normal in the console industry. And so, you know, I don't know if it's because people like to get really involved in the console fanboy discussions or, you know, if they just they just don't remember that this is what we expect from console generations or if they're just so young that this is their first real introduction to how a console launch goes. But it's just that this was the expectation. I've been saying it for years if you've been watching this channel, but Sony will have their final PS4 exclusives right near the end of launch. And then the next hardware, all of Sony's first party will move over to that. That's just the way it is like that for PlayStation 3, PS2, PS1, even while well, when PS1 started, right? Um, Sony even wanted to fund and publish a lot of titles on that, but 
you know, PS2. First year, you had Dark Cloud, Hot Shots, Jack and Daxter. Those were all within the first year. PS2 only, PlayStation 3, Resistance, MotorStorm, PlayStation 4, Knack, Killzone on day one, Resogun, a smaller title. But, you know, the first year, I mean, all of Sony's first party were they move on to the next platform. So, and there's always one big title on the outgoing machine as well. PS3, last, uh, the first Last of Us, Gran Turismo 6, PlayStation 2 had God of War 2. So, you know, it's just, I don't know. It's something where so many people just don't seem to look at history, which I guess is a good segue to our next news story here. But when you look at history, um, we can really look at PlayStation 5 and come to the conclusion that for the most part, this has been a pretty conservatively approached console. And I don't mean that in a way where I'm downplaying the excitement levels of PS5. I'm not saying it's a bad system or anything to that effect, right? But rather the news flow of how we've learned about it hasn't been all that different. Of course, there's some stark differences that you can draw, like the Wired articles, or the fact that it's been, it feels as though it's been so long since we've heard anything meaningful that we still haven't gotten the games revealed, but it's, you know, it's coming. Um, how it was piecemealed information instead of one event, like PlayStation 4, and even PS3. But the thing of it is, at least in the order of how they're doing it, this is about as normal as it gets for Sony where they'll do technical demonstrations, tech demos, they'll do all that stuff before they ever show you an actual piece of software that you can buy on it, right? Um, they just don't approach it like that. And the console design always comes close to last. I mean, God, with PlayStation 3, we had an E3 over an hour long of just technical talk, right? It was just, it was really long. But back then, E3 was really a lot for, really meant more for investors and retailers. So, you know, they let normal people watch it just fine. And uh, there was certainly still excitement back then, but a big part of E3, uh, well over 10 years ago was for retailers and investors. But it's like when I was showing you all the clips from Develop 2014 where we had Mark Cerny and Andrew House there talking about how it just seems very normal for them that that's how they always approach consoles for PS4 and the same thing is happening for PS5. And even more amazingly, we've got well over two decades of PlayStation history where there's a lot of company turnover, different leadership roles, and yet the company still approaches their hardware in this general timeline right it's still the same that's what's even more miraculous about this so i don't know i think people really need to start looking at what we know like what we know previously and applying that to what we can look forward to anyway moving on uh, another thing that jim ryan mentioned this past week when speaking to the bbc was trying to create the same level of excitement that we see at e3 and translating that into a digital showcase so he was quoted saying normally you would be in los angeles in some auditorium with 2,000 other people you'd be able to cut the adrenaline and the testosterone with a knife. We've got to find a way to do that and give the community a little bit of a jolt. When you watch the show next week, I think you'll see that we've been able to do that. You know, I think they will be able to do that just fine. Uh, Nintendo Directs have clearly demonstrated the enthusiasm levels are, are fine. Nintendo hasn't done traditional trade shows for quite a while now. Uh, inside Xbox, State of Play, these models work for both fans and the companies that have to spend so much money to, to go to E3, right? It's not cheap to go to E3. And as much as I'll miss E3, and many people will, for the traditional, you know, Sony press conference, um, you know, E3 is going to look a lot, lot different in 2021. But I, I sympathize with how people miss a, a major gaming event throughout the summer that was three, four days long, and you get all these big events thrown at you, all these announcements thrown at you in such a short period of time. But this model still works fine, and for this summer, at least, we've got all these... Uh, all these mini events that can play out over a longer period of time so it feels as though you're getting more information than than you otherwise would have but this is also something where if you weren't really at e3 if you aren't at this the, the conferences right i mean this isn't a huge a huge loss and for the vast majority of people that are actually at those conferences at e3 they're hating being there because they're working the show and well plenty of people will tell you that it's not fun to work the e3 show floor Moving on to our next news story, we've got more tweets to look at here from GamesBeat reporter Jeffrey Grubb, which thankfully we can keep looking at his tweets with a bit of confidence considering that his initial June 4th tease, at the time at least, was correct. So somebody sent over a link to the VentureBeat article, which in the article claims PS5 has the best console architecture in history, and he quote retweets this, and he says, this is true, lots of fawning over the work that Cerny did. I think part of this is that the PSI dev kits got out earlier and Cerny did a lot of work highlighting the efforts, but still, devs seem gaga for it. He goes on to say, for sure, but devs mean this in a relative way. They are saying, all things being equal, that this is the best architected console they've ever seen. Does that make sense? Like, beyond the normal advancements you would expect. 
Does that mean games are going to run better on PS5? I think in limited circumstances. Think about how Bethesda games struggled on PS3, but in reverse. But most multiplats are still going to be designed with SATA HDDs with inspect, so the GPU will probably remain the bottleneck. So this already plays into what we've heard a number of times now from other developers like Sony First and Second Party, which admittedly are biased, but also third parties are starting to confirm this now. We had prolific game programmer John Carmack confirm the efficiency of PlayStation 5, and that's something that I think we really have to have our tunnel vision set to here is the efficiency and ease of use working on the platform. I know it immediately goes to the teraflop debate or people trying to compare ps5 versus series x or playstation fans trying to convince uh series x fans that it is going to somehow work out to more power on playstation 5 which is ridiculous it's on paper we can clearly see that series x on the gpu front cpu front does have more power i think it's got faster ram too um it's got it beat on a number of fronts but that is such a small part of the overarching theme working on consoles and this is what i've been preaching for years no matter which one had more power before we had had the numbers, uh, they're closed boxes, it's resource management, something like teraflops is a small part of actually working on the hardware, and depending on how that SDK is built out, those are the results you're going to see. As we often reference, PS3 and 360 was a great example where if you can really utilize those SBUs on PS3, right? If you have the right resources, the right talent, the right team, you can do incredible things on PlayStation 3 and have amazing results. But clearly, that was not the case for a lot of third-party developers. That's why first party shined. 360 had much better multi-platform games for a very long period of that, uh, that console lifecycle. Even something like PlayStation 2, uh, where Silent Hill 2 is like the best version of that game, even though PS2 is a very weak console. It's a very weak platform compared to Xbox and GameCube. But the PS2 version of Silent Hill, how uh, the vector processing units work on PlayStation 2, the audio processing on PS2, how that console is architected, uh, it just produces the best experience for that game, where the fog effect is most prominent, where the sound design uh, just works out beautifully. And even though Silent Hill 2 has been ported to Xbox, PC, it's uh, part of the HD collection on PlayStation 3, it really is best played on a PlayStation 2, amazingly. Uh, that is just how it works out. That's why the SDK is so important for the real results that you get out of the platform. And this is why Mark Cerny opened the road to PS5 video with time to triangle. This is how long it takes to get usable code working on your platform. And for PS1, it was one to two months. For PS2, it was much more difficult. For PlayStation 3, it was one of the worst platforms in history for this. And then for PS4, they got it down to one to two months after having frank and open conversation with developers. You know, what do they want? Molding the platform around their needs. And with PlayStation 5, now it's less than a month. I mean, Mark Cerny, if you don't know his history, he's been in the industry for almost 40 years working not just with Sony, but uh, many other publishers. He works on multiple different aspects of game development. He's highly credited for giving that uh, 2004 GDC talk called uh, Method, the Cerny Method. A lot of people call it the Cerny Method, but this is a, a pipeline, a general workflow that developers should use when they're approaching their games, where pre-production is very important. Learn when to kill a project. Make sure you complete uh, four or five different complete vertical slices to find out if your game is fun so you can achieve proper funding and you don't waste millions of dollars. This is a method that is still used today in the games industry that uh, is highly credited from his talk over 16 something years ago. Uh, so I can fully believe that PlayStation 5 is a very efficient developer friendly platform to work on and that's what should really be taken away from it when we discuss uh, the results that we'll be able to achieve on the platform, right? You're going to get great looking games out of PS5 and the same can absolutely be said for Series X, but there might be examples where PlayStation 5 games run better, uh, but like Jeff Grubb explained, in limited situations, right? Really depends. Digital Foundry, of course, is going to have um, a very successful channel where they have plenty of videos really diving into the specifics once we have these games to test properly. And finally, we're just going to acknowledge or rather dismiss some rumors that have been coming up lately. This is something where I wouldn't normally talk about this, but it's getting sent to me a lot, so I'll talk about them and why you shouldn't believe them. One of them being a 4chan post. Kind of a long write-up about, you know, how the platform runs, game announcements, and it's just something where no one person would have access to that much information from all those varying fields from different developers, publishers, from the hardware side. Completely ridiculous. Another one, a Turkish retailer posted a listing for PlayStation 5, and I think in that listing, it claims uh, it will have PS2 and PS3 backwards compatibility and that the DualSense will have a touchscreen, which is also completely ridiculous, right? We know what the DualSense looks like. We see that it has no touchscreen, and 
I've only mentioned backwards compatibility a number of times, and I hate repeating myself on the topic, but do not expect PlayStation 3 and for PS2 and 1. Um, it's just a matter of if it is really worth the resources and effort to allow it via emulation or go through the software licensing again, which at that point you just get a very small library. Is it even worth it? You know, don't, don't believe everything you see. And there's another rumor about uh, the console design. I think this was in the 4chan post or the Turkish site or somewhere else, but somewhere claiming that the console is like really, really huge and ugly looking, which, well, for one, the design of it is subjective. So um, I think no matter what this thing ends up looking like, people are going to hate it. Uh, it's hard to like, because everybody's going to have some kind of idea in their mind and it's not going to be what they're thinking, especially based off of all the mock-ups that keep getting thrown around where the people making them aren't engineers and they don't have to worry about what engineers have to worry about when designing the console. So whatever it ends up looking like, I guarantee you, nobody's gonna like it, but over time, it'll grow on you and it will be, it will be PlayStation 5. But anyway, that's everything. We are all caught up for a regular LTPS on Friday and uh, the postpone event, I would imagine probably a week, um, unless they really wanna distance themselves from the June 4th event, especially considering that they ran live TV ads for that, right? So they might actually, maybe two weeks, worst case scenario, but shouldn't be that long. I'm sure they'll fill us in on that new date uh, sooner rather than later. But uh, other than that, thank you so much for watching. If you haven't yet, of course, please subscribe for the best PlayStation news, reviews, and updates that are here on YouTube. You can follow me on Twitter at Mr. Brian, and that is it. Uh, I will see you all on Friday. You stay safe, and you take it easy.